Guys, the Ukrainian Kraken unit has dropped another video detailing their efforts to liberate the town of Novoselevsky. And we are going to be breaking down just each phase of the operation, what it entails, and why it's so hard to take back just one village from the Russians. Now, before I get started, of course, YouTube, this is educational. I'm going to be doing a lot of explaining, and I'm going to be doing my best to not include anything uh, that's uh, violent or depicts injury. Nothing in this video does. I've checked it. Um, it's on other channels. It's fully monetized. Please, please don't demonetize my video. That said, of course, if you want the Uncensored Combat videos, I do all those breakdowns on the Patreon. That link is in the description. You also get access to a cool exclusive Discord. Who doesn't love exclusive discords. All right, let's crack into it. Okay, this I think is actually pretty sick. These guys are doing their pre-mission prep, it looks like, and or running drone operations, but out of somebody's house. And this is like a nice house. This is like a this this is like a middle-class house it looks like. Okay. So as you guys can see, all right, I think this is pretty cool. This looks a lot like a uh, standard or a talk setup. You can even see that these screens are ruggedized. They're folded into uh, what look like actually they go in these drawers. They look like they get pulled out of the drawers and stacked. Then the cables and other uh, essentials are in these other drawers. And if you do it right, these sort of things can be loaded up on the back of a five ton and carted to from site to site, from talk to talk. Um, you may think that this sounds like a secondary, less important operation, but it's not. Establishing a talk or tactical operations center is essential to coordinating the efforts of any unit of any size. And the ability to turn just about anywhere into a talk is important. They've obviously chosen this house. It looks pretty innocuous um, on the outside. You can see they blocked out all the curtains to prevent observation. They keep, of course, the clock running, uh, also essential for a talk. But you may, but you can even do it with a generator and a tent. You can run a talk out of a truck. Uh, in a pinch, you can run a talk just about anywhere. That's kind of the point. <clears throat> All right, so now what they're doing is what's sometimes called IPB, or Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield. So here is the town of Novoselivsk, and I've actually got it up on the map here. Here is Novoselivsk. Uh, you can see them looking out at it in this direction. It's currently listed as contested on this map. Uh, on the other map, it's listed as half Russian controlled, half contested. But you guys can see it's not that large a town. It abuts this railway. So when we look at this footage, uh, let's see. We can see, I believe this is the railway here. So this is a perspective from uh, right here. So here's probably those buildings in the front, right? These buildings right here are... Uh, let's make sure I pull this up for you, are these right here. So we know we're looking at it, the drone's hovering probably right about here. So what they're doing, the intelligence preparation of the battlefield is looking at the terrain, the geography, as we just did. It's also assessing enemy capabilities. So let's take a look. You can see they're getting, as see, this is them assessing, oh, look, there's Russian ground forces, Russian tank elements, and you can see they're probably looking for tank tracks to tell where Russian tanks are being positioned or repositioned. They're identifying what Russian units, what is the composition, the disposition of these units, how they're arrayed, how they're defended, uh, how they're patrolling, and how much they have, how much firepower they have to bring. Sizing up all these things is essential. Now, the next step in an operation, of course, is formulating your plan, that, assuming that's not depicted here. Um, <clears throat> so you come up with your plan. Actually, in a staff, I'm I'm creating a civilianized, like, shortened version of this. It's, it's very elaborate. Um, you use something called the MDMP. Uh, let's see if I can find it for you. Um, so the MDMP, uh, let's see, here we go, here's a chart with it. Um, the MDMP is very, very, very elaborate. 
Uh, oh, no. But like, okay, here we go. This is the military decision-making process. This is how, from receiving a mission, for example, hey, we want you to take Novoselivsk, and you, it, you have inputs and outputs. You're going to do your mission analysis. This is deciding what your commander wants, what your higher headquarters want. Um, <clears throat> you're going to look at uh, other products, known TTPs, and you're going to output the problem statement, mission statement, your initial commander's intent, planning guidance, uh, CCIRs, and EEFF, EEFIs are uh, key pieces of information, usually specific questions that the commander needs to have in order to make good decisions, in order to make good analysis. A CCIR might be how many Russian BMPs are in Novoselivsk. Or another CCIR might be what areas are Russian forces not able to observe and deliver fire on. Uh, IPBs and running estimates are uh, the intelligence estimates of the battlefield, right? Then you're going to do what's called course of action development, where you're going to come up with different ways to solve the problem of taking Novoselivsk. One might be, for example, uh, a frontal assault. Another might be a flank. And another might be an encirclement, right? Those are three possible COAs. But then you flesh each one out. You have your staff decide, okay, how many forces would we need for a frontal assault? Where would the frontal assault take place? You have to really game it out sincerely. You can't be like, you can't be like, oh yeah, the frontal assault won't work. Uh, you, we would, we would use everybody, and we'd take eighty percent casualties. Well, no, like think it through. Maybe it would work. You know, the Russians, uh, they're mobilized troops. They might, you know, there's a lot of reasons it could work. So you sincerely develop these codes. Then you war game them. You figure out ways in which each course of action could be beaten, could fall apart. Uh, then finally, you compare them. You evaluate which one is the strongest. Your commander approves the specific course of action. And then you produce orders. You uh, produce your orders. You disseminate them and you begin to execute your plan, or rather your subordinates begin uh, or finish their uh, planning process. They should already have started your subordinate units, their planning process, whether that's the MDMP or smaller units use what are called the TLPs. But this is how these sort of uh, processes go. And this is a way to think about, you know, even non-military stuff, right? You get a complex mission or assignment in your life, you come up with different courses of action, maybe buying a house, right? You know you need a house in the new city you move to. You look at three or four different houses, different kinds of houses. Do we want a big house, a small house? Do we want to pay more to be near the downtown or pay less to be further away? You game it out. You run the numbers. You say, how much will it cost us? How much time will it save? Will it be big enough if our family grows? You compare them, and then finally, you decide on a course of action and you start to execute the buying process. No different. So now you can see they're starting to execute and they're doing, they're preparing the battlefield with fires. So these fires, based on the reconnaissance, are delivering what look like 120 or 60 millimeter mortars onto targets in Novoslivs, because you can see here, Russians are uh, getting out of the way. They know that the fires phase of the battle is incoming. And you can see that they're identifying vehicles, uh, a T-90, uh, Right, getting the crew to bail as they take out the T-90. Um, they're taking out the BTRs. This is part of a systematic, right? Th these aren't, this isn't guesswork. This is part of the plan. The plan has looked carefully at how these vehicles are arrayed. And it's doing their best to reduce the total vehicle count, the total armored forces count in the area. You can see here, it looks like they target actually uh, maybe a ammunition depot of some kind. You can see the rounds kind of cooking off and many of these soldiers begin to flee their defensive positions. The preparatory fires continue. 
right? And now this begins the transition to ground operations. This is a this is a kind of also an old school way of doing things. Um, in the modern NATO militaries with a bit better training and a bit better coordination, you would see these two events, the fires phase and the ground assault phase being really, really close together, um, almost concurrent with each other. Uh, because what you don't want is the enemy to react to indirect fire by getting to cover and getting out of the way and then moving back in their positions prior to the ground assault, um, especially forces uh, like mortars and artillery, they can actually deliver pretty precise strikes, meaning that you can have friendly forces on the ground as long as you have a good sense of their location. As you can see here, ground forces moving into position and beginning to engage targets. Uh, they are trying to establish a foothold, it looks like. Um, you can see here, yep, this depicts Ukrainian forces as advancing through the, looks like, okay, so there's these. So it looks like maybe the northwest corner. I believe that's them advancing. So here's these. Uh, I think that's them advancing through this line here. Let's let's see if we can get a little, a little more precision. So yeah, the rail line is on the far side. These are on their right, meaning that, yeah, they're advancing through here. Here's the rail. Yep, this is where the advance is happening. So, again, they're approaching from this corner. You guys can see, though, if you have armored forces, you really only have two routes of advance, here and here. So you have to make a call in the outset which one of these two you're going to advance in. Now, again, dismounted ground forces can push in other directions. But it's armored forces still command a lot of respect on the battlefield. And you see they can move, move quickly, right? So they get down here, armored forces, and you have dismounts quickly trying to disperse. There's an armored, uh, up-armored vehicle. You can see, interestingly, no one's in the turrets, uh, which is probably maybe because maybe armored vehicles are seen as more of a liability than their worth in terms of their ability to provide support um again looks like these apcs these guys are trying to get out of here as quick as possible they're establishing their security right they're trying to get behind some cover they're bringing in um more armored vehicles and they are indeed out in the open but you can see their commander on the ground is trying his best to take these uh buildings here and get his troops out of this exposed area you can see more troops dismounting as they get ready to start this operation so it looks like each troop is assigned to take a foothold you can see here uh we'll back it up a few frames uh that it looks like this is a contested foothold looks like maybe there's russians or enemy in this building that's why all of these troops are behind this up armored vehicle these troops are really packed together and it can be hard it's not clear on why these troops are chilling here this guy is way out in the road putting suppressive fire into this uh house when all of these units should be moving onto the flanks or at least some of them right you don't want 80 percent of your forces on one flank while 20 percent flank in another direction you really want to maintain your mobility and your your momentum in these fights and you can see that these guys have, have stalled out their momentum a little bit but they're putting rounds down range um you can see here's a different angle of what looks like the same operation so you can see these apcs are getting out and these guys are going to form a support by fire element while the element in this building is probably going to be your assault element so they're going to be att assaulting um and they're going to be like crossfire think of it like this you have these the support by fire element is firing rounds this way and the assault element in this building is going to be firing rounds crossways it's going to become very hard for anyone in that building to get clear plus they're using grenades right so again i don't want to second guess these guys because they could this could be part of the plan but they do appear to be uh pinned in this position and it would 
benefit them almost certainly to get behind get into some some of these buildings it's much harder to dig someone out once they are inside a building um, right now you could see they are they can be seen by drones there's not really cover from artillery fire this is just a tight position i think they expected this house to be clear and it's not and it's causing considerable problems So you can see they are working very hard to get the Russians out of here. And finally, they do so. They're moving up. They're advancing and trying to get this initial defensive position, right? Establishing this foothold. You guys can see how hard it was. It was probably didn't look like it was that many enemy potentially in that house. It wouldn't take but a few to get that entire unit to get down. And that's how good a strong point a house or urban area can be. Now multiply this by an entire town or city, and you can see just how hard this sort of stuff can be. You can see the other problem with urban warfare is that a house isn't clear until you've checked every single room. You can see here they're starting to establish a foothold. It looks like Russian counter battery fire has started. Um, and this is a problem for a bunch of reasons. But once the enemy's uh, batteries have identified your position, again, when you're out in the open like this, it can be really hard to advance. Uh, this is a tough fight. This is turning into a real slog for the Ukrainian units. You can see that they're now in the city. They're trying to uh, push the enemy using a lot of their anti-armor weapons. You can see there, they're going after these grain silos. And again, they're trying to dig Russian forces out of these buildings. Ooh, see what I mean? When the when if you lose momentum on the battlefield, that can give the enemy an opportunity to start to target you. You notice that in this battlefield environment, they're 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 um, becoming more. Their formations are becoming more dense, and once you're in an urban area, you have to because it could be so hard to maintain fire discipline. And the, the total areas that you want to engage are so very much smaller. So as you get into more dense urban environments, you're going to make your, your formations more and more compact. And trust me, it's a real, real art to figure that stuff out. Um, and you can see here, now it looks like these forces have actually dug in. Um, that's how slow the going is, that they're building uh, entrenched fighting positions. This looks like it might be an artillery round that's hit here, that this person's then digging out into a proper fighting position. But now that they've dug in, they're going to be a lot harder to dislodge. You can see this has become an individual fighting position. And it's going to become a much slower slog to dig these guys out. And I want to point this out. This is sort of a trend broadly in this conflict is that you're seeing both sides become better and better at countering the other's efforts. Uh, you could see the Ukrainian forces are not as thrown by Russian artillery. They're actually pretty capable. Uh, and Russian forces are very effective at digging in. Despite, you know, some some questionable equipment, etc. You guys could see that that their defense, the earthworks are good, their defensive operations are, are good, and they were effective at stopping the Ukrainian forces from gathering a foothold, forcing them instead to dig in. So this is an example, I think, of of when we say that the battlefield has become a stalemate, right? Here's Novoselivsk, totally contested. This is what we're talking about, where offensive operations are underpowered compared to defensive operations. And this is typical of conflicts when they settle in and both sides from the private all the way to the general understand better about how to 
conduct operations and take fewer casualties and preserve your combat power. Uh, but when both sides do it, you end up often with a strong stalemate type environment. Look, for example, at you know Iraq. It's not quite apples to apples, but the U.S. effort in Iraq, we defeated the Iraqi army in a matter of days. But the insurgency, those that survived, learned and evolved quickly and proved able to fight the U.S. forces uh, effectively for another decade. So a testament to the fact that time and knowledge can be very decisive factors for a defender. Anyway, guys, that is all I had. Of course, be sure to check out the Patreon for all the uh, uncensored combat footage that YouTube won't let me show you. Um, this one's almost certainly getting demonetized, but that's okay. It was pretty cool. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one.